a lot of times people ask, um, what, how do you start composting? So I like to show examples of why people start composting, and oftentimes it's because they have a waste product that they're trying to get rid of. So whether you have a horse, or cows, or a few goats, maybe chickens, we can put in that slide, or some kitchen scraps. Um, organic matter is a terrible thing to waste. We all know that our landfills are um, full enough and that we should be trying to divert some of our material. So it breaks my heart when I see something really wonderful like horse manure going in a dumpster and going in the landfill. So we're gonna talk about what we can do with organic matter. Um, this presentation we're going to talk about windrows or bin composting. That's just one of the methods that people use to compost. You can also use um, passive windrows and that requires some technology so you don't have to turn the pile and there's more information available on that online. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up that there are many, many options for how to accomplish composting. And then of course we've all probably heard of composting with worms. That's a little bit different than the compost process I'm going to talk about tonight. We are going to encourage a hot environment in the compost process uh, that I'll speak about, and we don't want worms to be in that hot environment. However, they can complement this very nicely. And there are some uh, fact sheets and, and resources here if you're interested in learning more about worm compost. So what are the benefits of composting? Why should you take the time to learn to do this and um, get involved in the art and science of compost? It reduces your material, your waste material, by at least 30%. I put this number up and it's pretty conservative. Oftentimes I see 50%. So especially if you have something like horse manure or, or a large volume of material that you're trying to get rid of or process, this is a really wonderful benefit. Also, if you compost correctly, which we're all going to be able to do after tonight, um, you can minimize pathogens and weeds and any odor that may come from that uh, decomposition and insect problems. If you're composting correctly, you shouldn't really have fly issues and um, you, it should just kind of smell like a nice earthy pile in the backyard. Also, a, a complete, a, a composted material has stabilized nitrogen and phosphorus. And this is important because if it rains really hard after you apply your compost, you want your nitrogen and phosphorus and other micronutrients to stay where you put your material because your plants are going to need it. As Susie mentioned, my master's research um, investigated this question and we found that composted material does stay in the soil and the nutrients stays in the soil much more readily than raw manure or raw materials. So as a bit of an environmentalist, I'm excited about this point too. Um, produces a marketable material. So someone over here is already thinking about how to sell some things. You can always sell compost. And we all hear about carbon sequestration these days. And when you, when you compost material, kitchen scraps, manure, you're sequestering that carbon. You're, you're, keeping it in a stable, useful place, and then you put it in your, your garden or on your lawn, and that is a um, sink. So you're keeping carbon in the environment instead of gassing it up into the atmosphere. So this is one of my favorite definitions of compost, and it's a bit wordy, but I have it broken down into different words, and we're going to then define each one of these words to help understand the process. So in general, composting is a managed biological oxidation process that converts heterogeneous material into a homogeneous material. So this, if you find this uh, presentation online, this resource at the bottom is wonderful. Um, there's an on-farm composting handbook available from Cornell. And I'd say 95% of the book is available for free. The other 5% you have to buy. But what you need is available online, and it's a really good resource. So managed, this is what you do. Um, we provide uh, the carbon and the nitrogen to the pile. Does anybody bake, bake breads? Um, you know, you have, to, you have to have a recipe of materials to put into that bread before it's going to rise and 
be something you want to eat at the end of the project. Compost is kind of the same way. You need to think about the carbon and the nitrogen and the ratio that you're adding together. It's not quite as tricky as bread. You have a little bit more of a fluff zone, but that's a good way to think about it. And I'll go into what is carbon and nitrogen in the next slide. You need to also provide oxygen to the pile. Um, if you think about microorganisms, they're just like you and I. They need food, water, and oxygen. So if they run out of oxygen, they're going to become dormant and stop doing what you're asking them to do, which is decompose your material. So I've listed 5 to 50 percent. The optimal amount of oxygen that you want in that pile is 50 percent. So if you can think about all of your scraps that you're going to put in a pile, and there are little bitty pore spaces in between those leaves or chunks of vegetables or manure, half of those pore spaces should be full of oxygen. That's just a way to think of it in general. And the other half of those pore spaces should be full of water. The microorganisms need water to, to um, continue to metabolize, and also they use this water like, um, I like to think of it, of it as little super highways. The water connects the pores to each other, and as a microorganism is, is chewing up at the, the carbon and nitrogen and breathing, they are releasing waste into the system. And once that little pore where they've been eating and reproducing is full of their waste, they need a pathway to be able to move out of that area into a fresh spot so they can chew and eat and reproduce some more. So it's their little, it's their pathway to move around in the pile and do what they need to do. So carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and water. That's what you give them. I hope you can see this. If not, you can see it online. This is, um, we're looking at the carbon and the nitrogen ratios. This is just a general table. It's not set in stone. Um, somebody's kitchen scraps are going to be a little bit different than my kitchen scraps, so the numbers will be different. But I said you need 30 volumes or 30 carbons to one nitrogen. Well, you see, nothing is, is one to one here, so it doesn't come out that simple in the math. But these are some general ideas. Um, for example, if you have leaves, 35 to one, and then if you add, so these are going to be brown leaves. Anything that's brown is carbon. And anything that's green, green, is nitrogen. The way that I like to think about it is if you put a bucket of something on your, in your backyard on a hot sunny day, and you leave it there for 24 hours, if you come back and it's really smelly, that was a high nitrogen material. <laughs> If you come back and it's still pretty benign, you don't notice it, that's mostly carbon. So these are some general ideas of, of carbon to nitrogen ratios. And the way you can use this is think about volumes. Think of five gallon buckets or wheelbarrow loads. And if you're gonna use one bucket of one material and one bucket of another material, add the bigger numbers together, divide by two, and that's the general carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we won't do math because then we'll all glaze over. But this is, this is a useful resource for you. And then what do the microorganisms do? This is the biological piece of the definition. Many species of bacteria and fungi uh, metabolize. They're eating, they're growing, they're reproducing. They metabolize the carbon and nitrogen and the oxygen and the water in the process. And the number one thing that I'd like all of you to take away from tonight is that composting is farming microorganisms. You're not heating a pile, you're not breaking down the material, you're farming microorganisms so they can do all of that for you. So if they're happy, you're going to be happy. Oxidation, I kind of touched on this. This word just means in the presence of air. And the oxygen is used by microorganisms in respiration. And it's again in the pore space in between the materials that you've mixed together. And oftentimes if you have a whole bunch of kitchen scraps, you know they kind of get, it kind of gets sludgy, right? As it decomposes, it gets really dense. So I like to think about adding 
uh, bulking material because you want your compost pile to be fluffy because there has to be that space for oxygen and water. So it, again, it's as much of an art as a science. You have, you have to feel your compost pile. You can put on rubber, rubber gloves, but you have to touch it. You have to be excited to touch it and feel it and, and squeeze the material. You can wash your hands afterwards. So this is a pile of leaves. Um, it's one of the best things that I've found to use as bulking material. Many of us have large trees in our yard, and it's important to think about the longevity of your compost pile and the fact that the leaves fall in the fall. So what I do is when my yard is full of leaves, I take lots of trash bags or cans, and I fill those up and I set them over to the side. And throughout the winter, I use that material to add to my kitchen scraps so that I always have a constant supply of carbon. Some people have access to waste hay or waste feed. Um, there are many other options, and we'll kind of ask questions, or I'll ask you to let me know what some of your feedstocks are that you're curious about in a few minutes. But leaves are great. Yes? Well, grass clippings are, are a great um, discussion point. When it's green, it's nitrogen. Once it turns brown, it's primarily carbon. But a lot of times, grass clippings pack down on themselves and get really matted. So oftentimes, just the outside will turn brown. And if you pull it apart, there's still a lot of nitrogen in the middle. And it's also challenging with that mat that um, a lot of oxygen can't get between those layers. So I've mixed grass clippings in um, and kind of stir them up in your, in your wheelbarrow. They can be either one, depending on the color. So the, the dissimilar material that we're going to add can be any of the, any of the following. Um, kitchen scraps, bedding for chickens. I composted my chicken bedding and it was wonderful. It was brown because it was straw, but then there was urine and uh, waste on there, and so that was a nitrogen source. It was a really great compost material. Waste hay, you know we see the spoiled hay on the side of the road when it's rained. Um, spoiled feed or grain, leaves, grass clippings, horse manure. Does anybody have any questions about something they want to compost? Yes? What's your definition of kitchen scraps? Okay, good question. Um, no, generally, no meat, cheese, or bones. So pasta is fine, bread is fine, vegetables, fruit. Um, even avocado peels and, and orange rinds are okay. They're going to take more than one composting cycle. You will have to pull them out and put them back in or be okay with having an avocado rind under your lilac bush. <laughs> Did you have something in mind you were questioning? Well, I just wondered what uh, your definition was because I know you're not supposed to put meat in bags and the seeds are fruit. If you put them in there, they last for quite a while. Right, that's a good point. So if I, sometimes I spread my compost out after it's gone through the process and I'll see a tomato sprout up in my lilac bed. And um, I'm okay with that, you know. Some people might want their compost to not have any seeds, and, and it depends on how um, strict you are with what you're going to use it for. Some folks do sift their compost so that it's all really fine, black, lovely material. Other people are okay with having a, a little non-decomposed eggshell in their compost. So it, it kind of depends on what you think. Um, but a, a tomato or a, a fruit, an apple tree probably isn't going to make it. You know, it'll probably die and, and become compost of its own, on its own. Yes? Speak to temperature in your compost pile. I'll get to temperature in just a moment. Is that okay? Yes? What about wood ashes? Um, it's all carbon, but I've heard it'll make your soil more alkaline. Right. So, our soil typically is a little higher than, than neutral. We all have close to eight soil, 7.5 to eight. And um, adding wood ash to your compost does increase the pH. 
So it depends. If you're adding one bucket of wood ash per year to five buckets per year, I'd say that's probably okay. It's not going to greatly change your pH. Soil has an amazing uh, ability to buffer pH. But if you're going to unload your wood stove every other or every third day into the compost pile, it's probably too much. Yeah. Yes. I'm thinking in my case, I would have some leaf. Mm -hmm. But towards about August or so, I'm going to be running out of that kind of material. There's the. You can use the newspaper or cardboard. Also, there's the city leaf exchange. Thank you. So the City of Fort Collins Leaf Exchange, cardboard and newspaper does work well. Newspaper sometimes mats down on itself, so you have to make sure that um, you're just watching that. No, I, I believe most newspaper, um, the non-glossy pages, are they're fine to compost. Yes. Um, worms have a wonderful ability to escape if they have, if they're not enclosed in a system. They might die. Um, it's as sad as it sounds, they do become organic matter and are, a, you know, it's a good thing to add back to the soil. However, I, I have a, a love for worms, so um, they do leave the pile. If, you're, if your system is on the soil, they, they can get out. Um, some people have questions about pine needles. Pine needles don't really break down in, your, in one composting cycle. However, they really don't hurt your, you know, if you put your compost out with, com, with needles in it, it doesn't really hurt anything except your hands, right? If you have a lot of pine needles you're adding to your garden, just be, beware because you need to probably wear gloves. Coffee grounds. Coffee grounds are great nitrogen source for your compost pile, plus it adds some moisture. Anything else that you're curious about? Yes. I noticed you don't have shredded or even off of your trees up there. Correct. So shredded wood scraps, um, they do compost. They just take a very long time. So I tend to put that off to the side and take it to one of the facilities in town that actually grinds it up and uses it as mulch or take it to a neighbor who has a chipper shredder. Um, it just stays in your pile for a really long time. You have to think that microorganisms are so tiny and the amount that they can decompose and digest, it, it, it's just, um, it's slow. The lignans and cellulose hold up really well in a compost pile. Yes? It's okay. Lint, uh, pet hair, your hair, it's fine. It will decompose. Again, it might take a little bit longer if there's a whole lot of it, um, but it will decompose. It's all organic. Yes? What about grape stems? Grape stems, they do decompose as long as they stay wet. So um, one of the biggest challenges in our environment for composting is it dries out pretty quickly, correct? So you just have to manage it in an active way to make sure that the whole pile is staying wet. It will decompose. Yes? No, rhubarb leaves are poisonous, so I assume it's OK to put it in the compost like right now. As long as you don't eat your compost, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes? If, if, if it does dry out, and mine dries out far too many times, but you keep putting stuff in, it'll still come back. Right, right. So the question was, if it dries out, is that okay? The microorganisms are extremely forgiving. They just go dormant until the environment is um, reestablished to what they need to grow their population. So you don't have to inoculate your compost pile with microorganisms. You don't have to go buy a fancy bottle of something. They're blowing by right now. You know, the microorganisms that are doing all the work are on all the dust particles that are in the air. They're on your pets, they're in, on your shoes, they're everywhere. So compost, it wants to happen. So um, it's, pretty, it's pretty forgiving. I'm going to keep moving and then we can keep asking questions. Was it a burning question? Well, it's about the water. Okay, we got, we're going to do some more about water. Okay, 
So this is what you want, something beautiful and black that smells like the earth in the end. So you can do, make compost on any scale. You can use shovels and wheelbarrows or forklifts. It's important to think about choosing your site. Where do you want your compost pile to be located? It's nice to have an area that doesn't have tons of weeds because you're going to be making this lovely compost pile that's heating up and killing your weed seeds and then you don't want bindweed crawling up the top and adding more seeds to it right before you add it to your garden. You also want it to be close enough to the feedstock source. I use the word feedstock to uh, refer to anything you're adding in. So if it's way off in the back 40, you're never going to want to go out there on a cold, windy day and take your materials. So it's probably going to become dormant and stay that way. You should try to locate your compost pile near water because as we've all um, thought, it does dry out quickly and it needs to be convenient to add water to your pile. But then again, it needs to be 100 feet from waters of the state. So if you have a a stream that runs, a, a seasonal stream that runs through your property or an area that uh, just fills with a lot of water when it rains or when the snow melts and then that's <coughs> leaching down into the groundwater, don't put your compost pile in the middle of it. It's amazing where some people can rationalize that that's a really good place to put your compost pile until it rains or until the water comes and takes it away. And you, if you have a sloping property, try and control run on and run off. You can do that by just putting a hay bale on either side of your compost pile so it slows down any water that's moving through the pile. So to build a pile, you essentially layer the nitrogen material and the carbon material, either like lasagna, or you mix it up. One of my favorite things to do is put all of the material in a wheelbarrow, stir it up really good, and, and add water, and then go away for a little bit. Come back and see if it still feels wet, if it still is that 50%. One of my favorite um, quick ways to determine the amount of water in the pile and if it's okay or not, stick your hand into the middle, grab a good handful of the material, Squeeze it, not with a death grip, but with a good grip. And if between your fingers you see a little bit of water coming up between your knuckles, that's about 50% moisture. If it's pouring out, that's too much. If you can't get any water to rise between your fingers, it's too dry. Now remember, that's optimal. You can have a little bit more water or a little bit less water, but that's just a good rule of thumb. And you're gonna manage a batch compost pile different than a continuous pile. So in a perfect world, you're going to make your compost pile, set it aside, and leave it to do its process. But then we have all this kitchen material backing up, right? And we don't want that sitting on our back porch. So the way I'm gonna describe how to manage it is more for the batch system, but it's, it translates to the continuous pile. The way I build mine in the backyard is the lasagna style. I just keep adding and adding until it's, prime, it's mostly full. And then I do have a second area that I start adding to once this first one is full. So some people continue to just add to the first, the, their only pile, and they turn it. And then over the winter, they let it continue to cook and they don't really add as much or they at some point just pull out the bottom finished material and use that in their system or in their garden. So it's kind of up to you. Ideally, you make a batch. The second perfect way is to have two systems that you can go between and let one of them compost and fill up the other bin. So these are two really simple systems. Um, this is just chicken wire. It's really important to have a thermal mass you don't want a pile that's this tall and this big around because when the wind blows through, it's going to take all that heat that the microorganisms are um, creating and it's going to blow it right out of the pile. It's nice to have a pile that's about, you know, three, three, four feet tall and about at least as big around as your arms. So you just have that central heated core. I'll show you a picture of our goal in a minute. And then this is a really easy system too. These are just four pallets that are on T-posts 
And the only reason that there is even a need for a structure in my mind is just because it allows you to build it up. It doesn't spread out too much. And you can get pallets for a really small amount of money or free, and it's a nice way to keeps my dog out of the compost pile too, which is nice. However, the fox neighborhood fox sometimes comes and uses it as, ed, as a buffet. That's okay. So this is what we want our compost pile to look like. Some people who have large amounts of horse manure build windrows, and this could be the end of a windrow that you're looking at, or it could be a compost pile. You just want the central area to be large enough that when the microorganisms are active, the heat is going to stay in a pile. If you think about all of us getting up right now and running around in a circle, we're gonna increase the temperature in this room. That's basically what they're doing. So you don't have to have your pile in the sunshine either. It's, it's, the heat is coming from the inside. Three to six feet tall is really nice height. And um, you also have to think about this red core is what is killing weed seeds. It's what's killing pathogens. It's what's actually allowing the decomposition to happen. So it's important when you turn your compost to incorporate this tan portion into the center. That's why you have to turn your pile so that everything gets a chance to be decomposed by the microorganisms. We, like to, we need to monitor the windrow, so everyone needs to find a compost thermometer. You can get them at your local hardware store. There's actually one being rallied tonight, or raffled tonight, and John's gonna show us. It needs to be bigger than the you know, meat thermometer because your pile's going to be bigger. <laughs> so this one is great. And what's the temperature range, John? This one was zero to 200. Zero to 200. And it's pretty accurate because it's just about 70 degrees in here. <laughs> so we, I'll show you in a second uh, graph, but you, most compost piles get to be up to about 160 degrees. 130 is the ideal, but oftentimes it goes higher. So something that will read at least 130, 160 is important. And again, the heat is the biological activity. Um, it's an indicator of that biological activity. And I have a graph in the next slide that'll show you how you, uh, ob how your observations of the temperature tell you how to manage your pile. And after the, the heat starts to decrease, that's when you need to do something again. It's your microorganisms are starting to become less active because they are missing either carbon and nitrogen, water, or oxygen. So they're building, 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 building their population, and then once they start to decrease in their activity, they need something else from you. And typically that just means you have to turn it and check the water. So here is a compost pile keeping the feet of geese warm because it's actively composting after a, a snowstorm. So it can produce substantial heat in the winter time. Here's a um, graph that shows the relationship of time and temperature during composting. So if you'll follow me with the uh, triangle line, the top line, this square right here is day one of when I built the pile. Day one, the, the pile was at about 50 degrees. That was the ambient temperature outside. Day two, the pile was at 120 degrees. Day three, it was at 140 degrees. So it happens pretty quickly. And this is showing you that the microorganisms had everything that they need. And you see that this 120 degree maximum is sustained for about three days, and then it starts to decrease. And this um, goes down to about 10 days. So if you're really excited and really wanting your compost to be, you want to, you want to be as efficient as you can, you want to make this compost as quickly as possible, you can turn this pile as soon as you start to see a significant decrease because the microorganisms, again, they're still working, but they're, the population is decreasing because they're in need of something. Most often they're in need of oxygen right away, and then oftentimes a couple turns down, they definitely need water, if not right away. 
So then the second line you see with the diamonds, you see that the first temperature spike didn't get quite as high. So the population didn't get quite as large. But they're still working. There's still, there's still a spike, and then it starts to decrease, and you can turn the pile. Um, you can turn the pile way out here, too. You know, if, if you need to, if you're going on vacation, if you only do your composting on Saturdays, if you skip a week, it's okay. This, pile, this line can go all the way down here, and as soon as you turn it and give it what it needs, it's going to jump right back up and get right back on board with where it would have been if you managed it really efficiently. So again, it's a forgiving process. And so we turned it three times here. We keep seeing this uh, peak. Here we start to see that it's a little, it's not rising quite as high. This is a good indicator that the initial composting process, the thermophilic process, which thermophilic means heat-loving microorganisms, those microorganisms are almost completed with their job. So it's time now for you to continue to turn and manage it, but you're not going to see those same rises in the temperature. The temperature is probably going to be similar to this fourth line. And that's when the medium temperature loving organisms are going to populate your pile. They're called mesophilic, and they have just as important of a job to do, but it's not as spectacular on the curve. Um, there, I'll show you in a minute a slide that shows what they do. But these guys are the ones who do the most breaking down. They, um, they, they make the particle sizes smaller. They digest a lot of the material. So does anyone have any questions about what to do when looking at this curve? So the question was, in order to keep your temperature high, do you keep adding fresh green and brown? This is when you get to the question of, are you going to do a singular batch, which this is a batch, and the batch is moving towards being finished. If you're going to do continuous addition, you're just going to see probably the first, second, and third line, first, second, and third line. It's going to keep adding because essentially it's never going to finish until you stop adding material. Then you'll have this up and down and, and end product. Did I see another hand? Okay. So after you see that last drop in temperature, you want to keep monitoring it. Um, again, the mesophilic microorganisms are doing their job. You can keep turning it and when the temperature decreases and check the moisture. The moisture doesn't have to be right at 50%. They're a little less picky because they're not quite as, there's not quite as high of a population and they're not doing quite as much work. But you still don't want it to dry out or else this final process isn't happening. And I turn it four, five, six times. Um, to allow those microorganisms to do their thing, and then I kind of set it aside and let it cure. So if you think about it, that's about 10, 10 to 15 turnings if you're doing the batch style. And then your pile should be, should be complete. However, as soon as I say that, someone's going to call and say, I've turned it 20 times and it's still heating. That might be because you added something really different than my kitchen scraps and leaves. So every pile is different and you now will have the tools to kind of interpret it yourself. So when the temperature curve flattens, um, these microorganisms take over. And if you keep the pile moist, then they're going to be happy and healthy and doing their job, which is essentially they they're biodegrading things, but they're also bringing the pH more towards neutral. So some, some compost piles are, very, are much more acidic, and some compost piles are much more alkaline, depending on what you put in it. Either way, these microorganisms help bring the pH closer to neutral, 7.0, which is fascinating, right? It's the same, same guys, and they're doing this great work that we can't even begin to understand because we don't know what they are. <laughs> we only know some of them. And once these are finished, these microorganisms are finished with their job, then I set my compost aside to cure for a couple of months. If you're rushing because you want to put this in your garden, you can shorten this, but curing your compost allows the final set of microorganisms to come in, and they're kind of the, the ones that live in your soil. They're the native microorganisms. They're the 
the ones that are going to help um, your plants in your area access the nutrients. So when is your compost finished? When can you use it? Um, after the heating cycle stops, after you cure it, and you just want it to smell like earth. Has anyone smelled that smell, the compost smell? I love it because there's actually a, a microorganism that we're smelling. It's called actinomycetes. When we think of that earthy compost smell, it's actually those guys. And so they are some of the characters that are curing your compost and helping you recognize that it's finished. There's also this really cool um, Solvita test that's available through this laboratory in Maine. They're, I think, $6 a pop. You can order them. They come in a little tiny case, and they measure a couple of things um, with little color paddles that are really easy to interpret, and they tell you if your compost is finished. And it's really a lot of fun to just do it one or two times just because then you'll have the hang of it and know that your compost is ready and it's done and it's not going to burn your plants. Only way it would burn your plants is if it's not mature and finished. So check that out. It's a fun, um, it's a fun little lab thing to do. So to assure quality compost, don't add meat, cheese, and bones to your pile. They will decompose but it just requires a more uh, controlled climate, and oftentimes you see critters coming and taking that material out of your pile. Also, know where your feedstock comes from. If you get grass clippings from a friend, ask them if they have put a whole bunch of chemicals on their lawn, and just, just know if that's okay with you. If that, it will decompose, it will compost, but make sure you know what's going into your compost pile. If, does anybody have horses? Anybody composting horse manure? Um, they use dewormers. Dewormers um, keep horses systems worm free and those do break down in the sunlight. So if your compost is turned enough then the dewormer is going to be uh, broken into other materials and it's you're not going to have dewormers in your garden so you should have worms in your garden. Um, Heavy metals, some people ask me about this. It's not typically a problem unless you're using um, biosolids, which is treated human waste, which some people do this, and it's a great thing to do, um, but you're probably not doing it in your backyard. <laughs> so you probably don't have heavy metal challenges with your compost. And know that your, your compost is mature. This again is shows that you have low microbial activity, so the temperature is low, it means your material is fully composted, and you won't have ammonia burn in your plants. Nitrogen in your garden will be, um, won't be immobilized, it'll be ready for the, the plants, and you shouldn't have pathogens in your compost if it's fully mature. Test your compost and your soil. Every, people call me and say, how much compost should I put in my garden? And I say, I don't know how, much, how many nutrients are in your soil. So it's important and, and really useful to test your soil at least once, just so you have a baseline and see if, if you have a high nitrogen need or a high phosphorus need. And then you'll understand what your compost is giving you. Some people don't test their materials. And I, rule of thumb, say about an inch of compost across the top and till it in or work it in is, is plenty. More is not always better because soil microorganisms need um, a real porous material and, and compost is a great thing, but at some point you, it, there needs to be native soil too. Current local news on compost. The city of Fort Collins has purchased two earth tubs, and I'll show you pictures in a second. Green Mountain Technologies is the manufacturer of these uh, tubs and they're in vessel compost systems. Since September 2010, a conservative, I, I think it's a conservative estimate, over 7,000 pounds of pre-consumer food waste has been diverted. Pre-consumer, by that I mean um, food that's coming back to the back of the kitchen from a restaurant after it's been in, on a plate in front of someone is not composted. This material is what the cook, the kitchen, diverts when they're cutting the tops of carrots off, when they're taking 
wilted lettuce leaves off when they're peeling potatoes. So all of the prep food from Austin's, Enzio's, and Cafe Ardour is being composted right now. And it's a, a beautiful product that they're sending out every day. Has anybody ever seen Rob Martin, who's biking up and down the streets with a, car, a trailer full of either bagels or compost or uh, brown glass? He is the one who is picking up the compost, compostable materials from these restaurants, and he bikes it to the Earth Tub, which is um, it's in on Mason and Laporte, essentially behind a fence, and. He takes it there, we add it to the earth tubs, and then the finished material is being used by the City of Fort Collins Parks Department, and they're going to use it in all of the um, planter pots in Old Town. So all those beautiful flowers through the alleys and in Old Town, that's gonna have consumer food waste in it. It's a lovely circle, isn't it? So these are the two, this is a picture of the two earth bins, or earth tubs, excuse me. You can see that they do have electricity. That's to run the auger. I'll show you a picture of the inside in a moment. They also have these handles on the outside. This is essentially a giant mixing bowl with an auger that turns. And these handles, we walk around and, mix and move the auger so it hits all areas of that material. And there's a... Um, a I'm blanking on the name, biofilter off to the side. So any smell that's coming off the top of this goes through a layered carbon system that's kept wet just so that uh, is kind of scrubbed. This, it, there's no real smell. And then there's a little leachate tank here for any excess moisture that comes out the bottom. You see that tank is really small because it's, it's pretty minimal. This is the lovely compostable material. It looks nothing like my week old stuff that's under my kitchen counter that goes out on Saturdays. This is like a salad bar. And you can see they're in just Rubbermaid containers so Rob can easily lift them. They're not over 50 pounds. He has multiple containers. This is inside the bin. Whoops, excuse me. You can see there's the auger. There's a better picture on the next slide. Lots of coffee grounds. This is, um, looks like Austin salad stuff. And we add um, leaves. We've been using leaves from people's backyard, city employees' backyard. Um, we've also been using some wood shavings. I can go into more detail about how this works if you'd like, but um, it's, it's fabulous and it's easy. So this is the auger. You can see um, it, it kind of lifts and turns and grinds at the same time. It's on a little bit of an angle. And again, we walk it around and then we use the electricity to move it in and then we turn it a different direction so we're able to go around the perimeter and then kind of the inside of the bin. And there's Rob checking, we check the temperature here, we stick a thermometer in to check the core temperature and then this was a day that we were actually going to I believe harvest some of the materials so we were starting to rake things around and move it out. He was pulling it out. You can see there's some um, unfinished material. The Parks Department is going to screen this and put anything that is not composted well enough back in and recompost it in the next cycle. And we tested the material and it's, it's really low nutrients but low salts. It's essentially going to act like a really good potting soil. They're going to add potting soil to it, but it's not a high nutrient material, which to them is really good because it's not very risky to use. Also, at CSU, um, they have just, I bet it, it's about a month ago, have just installed the Earth Flow, which is manufactured by the same folks at Green Mountain Technology, and it's a 10 times bigger system. So, the Housing and Dining Services has purchased this system and initiated this process, and they're diverting dorm food, same thing, pre-consumer food waste, that is pulped. They have a pulper and a centrifuge, so they're grinding the material and then pulling out a lot of the water. I'm not clear exactly what is going on with the water, but they're trying to make the transport of this material out to the Foothills campus um, cost less. And 
Then they're mixing it with horse manure from Mount Manure out by the horse facilities. And then they water it. But actually, I made this slide before I met with them last week. The material is, is such a good balance right now that they're not having to add any water. We kind of got everything wet up, and now they're not having to add any extra fresh water, which is good. And then it's um, turned and processed, and then it's going to be utilized on campus for a lot of their landscaping. And they're just getting up and running. They're not at full capacity right now, but they're expected to divert a ton of food waste per day, which is pretty amazing. And they're thinking someday they'd like to have more than one of these. So this is a schematic on how it works. The food waste goes, it's kind of funny. It actually, you know, we read left to right, but start the other way. <laughs> um, food waste goes in, and then the same auger that you saw in the other system moves that material from the bottom up towards the top and along the system, almost like a conveyor belt. So it continuously moves the material towards the end where it's going to eventually be harvested and used. And the system, the owner's manual says 15 to 17 days and it should be finished because it's continuously turned and, and the material they're adding is kind of at its prime. So here are a few pictures. Sorry if they're a little small. This is a gentleman, Scott, who's been in charge of getting to know the system and, and kind of working out all the bugs and the quirks. And you see here there's a lifter because these, these trash cans full of food are way too heavy for a person to lift. That's really nice, so Scott will stick around. Um, so they put garbage cans of food waste, and then they, you can see Mount Manure back here in the background. They have plenty of manure waste to work with. So then they, they have a front end loader that loads garbage cans full of that material as well, so he has a volume uh, estimate that he's working off of. You can see here the auger moving, and it's it, pretty much since the food waste is pulped, it looks like a pretty homogenous material, and it's very um, fragrant. It's a diff totally different smell than what you smell in Old Town because it's just different food waste. They are putting some fat and meat in here because it's such a managed system, it's okay and it's working. And um, here you can just see that this auger system moves back and forth, up and down. So it's pretty exciting that these two things are right in our backyard. Any questions about those? Yeah. Sure, the question is, is it a good idea to pulp your material at home before you compost it? It will speed up the process and it will create a more homogenous material in the end if, if there are no large particles. John has taught me a good way to decrease the particle sizes of the material that I'm composting. You can just put it all in a five gallon bucket and take a, a um, rounded in shovel and just chop it up. You know, just especially when it's watermelon or um, acorn squash or something that's really big, because the more surface area you make available for those microorganisms to chew on, the faster the process is going to happen. Yeah. Yes. There is a lot of humidity on the on the windows. Does that? Hold in the moisture? Is that it does hold. No, we just don't have to water it because the moisture's not going oh, anywhere. Um, you definitely have to open up all of the sides and the ends before you can get close to it because all of the ammonia that's um, released during the composting process is really strong. So you have to kind of let it vent off before you get close to it. It takes, you know, moments. But it definitely is, since it's an in vessel system, it doesn't dry out near as like anything else. John, come up here in case folks have questions about vermicompost. I'm here. That is a good idea. <laughs> That's Anybody a very good idea. Some other chemists? Yes. How do you test your soil? How, the question is, how do you test your soil? Um, there's a soil testing lab on CSU campus, and there are other private ones in Brighton and Denver. There are also extension publications on CSU's website. You can just go to that website and type in how to take a soil sample. Um, essentially, you just want a sliver, a, an even sliver, down the depth of your plant that you're planting in your garden. I tend to tell people, try to take a sliver about six to eight inches deep, 
And you can dig a hole and then use a shovel and just go down the side of that hole. And it's better to take more than one sample. If you have a large garden, you can take multiple, put those in a, a bucket, stir the bucket up and take a big handful out and send that to the lab so you don't pay to send five pounds of soil. Are yes? Are you supposed to touch your pump or your testing soil so you use a spoon and some of your hands can get in there? I tend, I usually put on gloves so that your anything on your hands is not getting into your soil. Also though, it's good to know that a little bit of what might be on your hand might be um, diluted out by the amount of soil that you're actually testing. If you're like me, you're, you're not able to fertilize perfectly. You're kind of going to fertilize the best you can because one extra granule or one extra shovel of something might change, be a little off from perfect. But you can send that soil in a paper bag, not a plastic bag, because that's going to um, create a little microcosm where microorganisms can continue to break down whatever's in your soil while it's in transport. Send it in a paper bag or take it in a paper bag to a soil lab. And I just ask for a routine soil sample or a routine soil analysis. And there are also great documents online or available through the lab that helps you understand how to interpret those. And a lot of the labs will give you a general interpretation. For example, you need to add X amount of nitrogen. Yes. So he's talking about a sheet, a sheet composting system where you're basically building the lasagna layer in your garden and you're just keeping the food scraps from being exposed to the environment by covering it up with soil or a carbon source. And then the, mic the same microorganisms are in the soil and they're doing the job in the garden. So you, where you turn it over, you try and get the, the shovel, you try and get the shovel to mix up as much dirt as you can. So you don't have any faults or anything. So it's all dirt and compost. And no, it's so convenient, no smell. You only no have water, to lift it no once. <laughs> What do you do in the winter? Huh? What do you do in the winter? Winter time, well, I live down out, out in the, when I have down the country, I just run top of the ground. Yeah. And yeah. then when it warms up, you just bury it. There are fact sheets on sheet composting also. Um, we call it lasagna gardening. Um, I don't, I've been doing it for years, except for I don't use a shovel and go into the soil. I put it right on top of the soil, put cardboard on top of that for a weed block, and then wood chips or a mulch on top of that or compost on top of that. You never have to walk in the mud in the soil. And all those critters do it, well, what we're doing is basically mimicking nature when we do it that way, sheet compost. It works very well. I had free access to shredded corn cobs. Yep. Don't never do that. It'll take years. So this is the art and science of compost combining. You. I think there are so many options out there to compost your, your waste material so it doesn't go to the landfill. Waste doesn't even, it's not the right word, but you all know what I'm talking about, your, your uh, resources. Any other questions? Yes? How long does it take you to get a, a full compost pile? I mean, I'm thinking this, you know, kitchen scraps, that kind of thing. About how long does it take you to get one batch? And at my house, I end up putting a lot of um, landscape, you know, my weeds. You can compost your weeds as long as they haven't gone to seed. Um, so that's a lot of plant material. I have two batches, and I typically fill one up during the summer, and then the other one I fill up throughout the winter. I did have chickens at the last house that I lived in, and we filled up our batch a lot faster because we were using they were eating more of the food scraps, but we had lots of, um, of hay and bedding to compost afterwards. If you have more garden and less yard, you'll fill it up faster. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, at her place is an average size city lot. And the thing that I don't encourage a lot of is going out to get stuff, more stuff, because right. then you're just putting a bigger carbon footprint on. Um, the planet running around getting more stuff. Uh, do whatever you can about with in place. I teamed up with my neighbors and we had a 
a short fence so we could both add to the compost pile and that was a lot of fun because I didn't always want to turn it every Saturday but somebody else was there to help with the work too. So to get a finished product you do have to stop adding at some point and and manage what's in there so it can go through that full cycle or if you're never going to do that you should probably get worms because worms will um, produce they will decompose the material faster and and you will have a finished product yeah it's a lot of people ask me but they you know most people who do worms do them indoors because most people in the world don't have a yard to do it in. They live in apartment buildings. And, okay. and Tom, did you mention that it's a specific type of worm? It's not just a Yeah, worm. It's, that's a good point because that's gone around and around. It, it's a specific type of worm called Icinia fetida or there's a bunch of um, composting worms. They live on top of the soil in nature and they can take temperatures that are go really high um, up to 90 degrees all the way to um, 30 uh, freezing. And other, and other worms are soil dwelling worms. They're very temperature specific. So they will go deep in the soil and, and they follow the temperature of the soil at like 52 degrees, that's where they stay. And when it rains like it is now, you'll start seeing a bunch of worms on the soil. Those kind of worms aren't good in a compost pile, they're good in a soil situation. Whereas red worms um, will eat half their own weight every day if you've got a thousand worms which is about a pound and you've got material that's um, run through a shredder like they're 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 shredding it or turning it into pulp um, think of worm uh, composting worms as a straw with muscles imagine that <laughs> and all them critters that are in there the bacteria the fungi um, the amoeba the nematodes, all those things are turned into a smoothie for the worms. They can't eat, they don't have teeth, so it has to be broken down in, in a, you know, a decomposition state. Anyways, um, it's a surface area thing, and just because we build our houses so bad, I've been teaching people how to do it outdoors here year round. If we have the space or yard to do it, most yards can do it. Daddy's been doing it under a big pile of leaves for years. And you just, it's insulation. They survive in the Or micro. an old refrigerator on its back without the Freon. You can paint it so it doesn't look like Sanford and Son and you have a big worm bin. <laughs> well, yeah, we're gonna have a contest here, I think this year, who's got the coolest painted worm bin. <laughs> so we got some really good ones already. Do we have some more questions? We have a few more minutes. Yes. Yeah, you create a small pile, maybe eight inches deeper or so, and then it's got um, three square foot of surface area, and you start with the worms there, keep it dark and wet. Worms like it dark and wet, and anywhere is the temperatures between 50 and 70 degrees or 80 degrees, because again, you're growing bacteria and fungi that are doing the work before the worms get to eat it. And then there's, you know, solar power to heat it in the winter and dark and wet covers, you know, canvas or old, old uh, comforters. I use carpet um, just to keep it dark and wet. It's pretty simple, just mimicking nature. You ever been in the backyard and you had a barrel sitting there for a long time on the grass or the weeds, pick it up and it's, there's nothing underneath there. It's just mimicking that system. Thank you all so much. Happy composting.